Chapter 19, Civilization's Inferno, Rise and Reform of Industrial Cities. That, can, that sounds kind of scary, and inferno in, implies some chaos going on. Rise and then reform. So we're talking about something that needs to be you know, uh, brought down to create uh, rights for people. So that's kind of the, the, you know, what that's implying, reform. And we're talking about industrial cities here. So we're still in our industrial era. 1880 but this chapter goes to 1917 that is the that is the year that the United States enters World War one okay and like I said before that will change everything okay so this is the era we're in the industrial era the industrial revolution era but it's also the era of the progressive era the progressive movement okay so what is this this is the, this is a reaction to all the abuses of the industrial revolution yes there's positives. Uh, assembly line and you know uh, mechanization industrialization makes mass production possible uh, the prices of products drop uh, people you know common people can afford more uh, items that used to be considered uh, a luxury but the other side of it is people living in squalor not making any money and living lives of despair so the progressive movement is a reaction to all the negatives of the industrial revolution and, and look to try to reform it and make it more, uh, you know, easier for a, for a working class person to, to live in this in this type of system. OK, so clear. So so you have this is the rise of the big cities, too. And this is the rise of these large industrial, you know, most in the northeast uh, and all that comes with it. So you go from a farm oriented agrarian country to large industrial cities. And it was difficult for some people. Clarence Darrow, you may, you may remember him as one of the attorneys in the Scopes Monkey Trial about teaching evolution. He was the one that was on the modern secular uh, side versus the, the uh, religious side. So creation versus evolution, right? Uh, he, was, he would be on the evolution side. So this is out of the introduction of your chapter. And this is a quote by him when he was a young man coming to the city for the first time. There's no place so lonely to a young man as a great city. When I walked along the street, I scanned every face I met to see if I could not perhaps discover someone from Ohio, where of course he's from. Instead, he saw a sea of human units, each intent on hurrying by. If it had been possible, I would have gone back to Ohio, but I didn't want to borrow the money and, did, and I dreaded to confess defeat. So we live in this kind of impersonal world today on some levels. People aren't as friendly as, as they used to be. Now, I mean, don't feel too bad for him. It turned out okay for him. He became a famous attorney. But again, consider to be a an example of this modern secular man, okay? So these new modern cities pop up, and they turned out to be very impersonal and somewhat bleak, depressing, not inspired. And people come to the big city for this adventure. You work all your life for what? To live in the masses that, that no one's got any money, okay? So we talked about the excesses of wealth that, that does not trickle down to the masses, the working class. So this is the problem. And so moving into the progressive era, people pushed for reforms. In, you know, Common people did not experience any of the new prosperity. They lived in squalor and poverty, long hours, poor conditions. Child labor, as young as seven, working in factories. Okay, very dangerous with, with machines around that, that, that could perhaps hurt them, okay? Uh, so reform became popular, and we've talked about this before. Who made it popular? Middle and upper class white women with time on their hands and disposable income because their husbands are middle managers, making more money. They emerge up into the middle class, and these women find themselves in a nice situation where they can afford housekeepers and nannies, and they have free time. Okay, they they choose to use their free time productively by starting reform movement, which we talked before about how men chose to get to, to go to the bars and get drunk. Okay, so chapter 19 is, and I'm talking in generalities here. I don't mean everybody. Chapter 19 is mostly about the rise of these great industrial cities: New York City, Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh. So notice that these cities are all in the north. So the south is still rebuilding, still trying to get their legs under, still trying to compete and catch up with the north. Okay. So what's happening in these cities? You got all these all this influx of different people. So you have racial strife, not always about color. 
It's about just different people not mixing very well. We talked about Catholics coming and, you know, the it, the uh, insurgence of Jews to, to a mostly white Protestant country creates problems, but, but also racial about color. Uh, why? Because because many African Americans are coming to the cities for jobs, and we'll see this in World War One and Two in a huge way. The, the Great Migration, it's called. Uh, they realize that living in the Jim Crow South, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any opportunity at all. I might get lynched one day, so I'm going to go north and try to get a job in these big factories. So suddenly you've got people of all different races and creeds and cultures and religions fighting for the same jobs. Very competitive, okay. And at the bottom of the rung were black men, routinely passed over for factory jobs. Uh, they had it worse than other groups and had a severe lack of opportunity. Remember I said uh, early in, in the class that success in America depends on your access to opportunity, not, not that does everybody have it, okay? Not necessarily. So you have this strife and you have race riots. So, you know, if you were to talk to a person my age, you know, 50, 60 years old, and you ask them what a race riot is, they would probably say, if you're asking a white person, they'd probably say it's when African Americans riot and burn, burn down their own town, okay? And we've seen this. The, these things have happened. But truly, race riots began, and the definition of a race riot is when angry white mobs go into the black areas, beating people, in some cases, killing them, to keep them away from the polls, to keep them from coming and getting jobs. You get out of here. You're not welcome here. Atlanta, Georgia in 1906, 24 blacks were killed, over 100 wounded when the white mobs came into the black areas and did this to them. But it wasn't just in the south. You know, Cities in the north also were having these same problems. And you have the rise of, of nativism. And we've talked about this briefly, I believe, this idea that the people that are here deserve all the all the rights and, and nobody else should come, okay? Uh, this idea starts pre-Civil War with, with the huge influx of Irish and the white Protestants don't like that. So again, white on white uh, anger and conflict, but you have this push to to not have Catholics come here. The, the, the white Protestants are very fearful of these people, Judaism, you know, bringing in these different types of religions, okay? So here we see a picture again where two white men very happily smiling for the camera after they beat up a black man. That, that guy looks in pretty bad shape. Uh, he's been beaten severely. And these boys did it, but they're happy to get their picture taken. It, it just didn't matter to them. They were happy to look, look what I did. Aren't, aren't I a hero? And then this, this becomes, I mentioned before, I may have, I may, may not have. This kind of behavior almost becomes like a sport, especially in the South, lynchings and so on that will, that will come down the road here. Okay, so all this... All this strife comes along with the growth of the big city and opportunity, okay? <clears throat> uh, so it's about self-preservation, okay? So what were these cities like? You might, much like modern cities, the big city, right? That You see these, uh, you, you go from streams and trails to steam engines and railroads and automobiles. Suddenly everything changes, and it happens pretty quickly, and the former rural agrarian countries replaced by a modernized country. So you have these skyscrapers never seen before, huge towering buildings and, you know, lit up from electrical power. So you can see the downtown sections of these towns from miles away like you can today. If you're driving across Texas going to Dallas from California, you know, it's, it's a pretty remote area that you're crossing for hundreds of miles. But you can see the glow, if, you, if you're traveling at night, you can see the glow of Dallas hours before you get there. Okay, it's, it's a huge city lit up. So this changes. That This was not the way it used to be. Old cities were dark. <clears throat> they may have had gas lamps. You know, houses used candles. They, they didn't have these bright lights. Now, now you got all, all these lights. Uh, so people come for the opportunities, leave the farm, and immigrants come by the millions and change the fabric of America. America became multicultural. So multicultural, not mu not necessarily multiracial. Multicultural means you could look the same. You could be white and people but have conflicts. So I would say America in this era became multicultural and multiracial because you have all different types of people, color, skins, religions, language, and, and it doesn't go uh, always very well. Okay. 
So if you if you come over from Eastern Europe and 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 you have your people, you tend to stick together, right? And you live by each other for for protection and safety and solidarity, right? You you help each other get on your feet. If you've been here for ten years, you want to help more of your countrymen learn learn the ins and outs of how to how to survive in America. Okay, so you have the rise of what's called enclaves. So what is that? A portion of territory. In this case, we'll say a city. A portion of a city within or surrounded by a larger city whose inhabitants are culturally or ethnically distinct. So inside of a large city, you have a, an area where people are, are culturally or ethnically distinct. So a good example of this is, of course, is Chinatown. And this would be an enclave. And many, many of our cities in America have, have Chinatown. In, in San Diego here, we have Little Italy. And there's places like Koreatown and, and India Square and Little Saigon. And these are all places where people of a certain ethnicity go and live because they, they're, they're comfortable with each other. They feel safe. Okay, But if you go to these places, you go to Chinatown in San Francisco, you almost feel like you're in a different country. Everything's in Chinese. Everybody is Chinese. The business people interacting with each other. So it's almost like you're in a different country. Okay, But these people come together to help help each other, <clears throat> and they start mutual aid societies, okay? These are urban aid societies to, to serve a specific ethnic group. They would collect dues from members to pay support to people in case of a death or a disability. So taking care of your own, that's what they're doing in this new and foreign country to them. So if a, if a family's breadwinner, the husband dies, the people come together to help the widow to stay, you know, stay, stay afloat, okay? Uh... So as these enclaves took hold, many of them grew grew very large and became very corrupt. And these are known as political machines. So an, an enclave that goes up many steps higher with 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 uh, mass control. Okay. Uh, and so again, the movie 2000 uh, from 2002, Gangs of New York, I mentioned before, was about nativism. It's also about about political machines and and Tammany Hall run by Boss Tweed. This is a real person. Boss Tweed is a real person. And he he kind of has the, a complete grip on every aspect of city government in New York. And he calls his his government Tammany Hall. Okay. Tammany was was named after a, an Indian chief named Tamarind. So these these people gain economic and political control and gain a, a base of power. And they become very corrupt and very powerful. They run the big cities for their own gains, all about greed. But that's only part of the story. It's not that's that's the part that we that we see or we learn about these people, corrupt and greedy, and they certainly were that. We're gonna watch the film here in a minute. You can see how bad it was with 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 Bosch Tweed here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but there's a good side to these machines also, uh, because what comes out of their power and control is streetcars, clean water, gas lamps. Garbage collection. We we talked about that. No one thought about that. You have a big city, people living here. Where do we put our garbage? Where where do we put our industrial waste? Nobody thought about that. In the past, you just burn your trash in on your farm in the field somewhere. Now you gotta. It's everywhere. How you know? What do we do with it? Okay. So these 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 powerful political machines, even though corrupt, they got some things done also that helped their people. Huge public projects, aqueducts, bridges, parks. The New York City City's uh, subway system came out of the a political machine. Okay, let's take our first break and watch this film entitled "Boss Tweed." Thomas Nast. Now, Thomas Nast is a political cartoonist that, as you'll see in the film, writes uh, draws some very derogatory cartoons about Tweed. So we'll learn about the bad side of him mostly in this in this film. But don't forget, there's a good side to him too. Okay, uh, so go ahead and watch the film and come on back. Okay, so the parts of town that have the best lights, cleanest streets, were the areas run by the people that have the most clout. These these political machines that got things done for their people. Okay. So we talked last chapter about the muckrakers. You, you rake up all the muck, to expose the evils underneath. Okay. We talked about Jacob Reese up in Sinclair. Reese photographed the New York tenements of the wealthy people, especially women, would see the horror of their workers' daily lives. And up in Sinclair exposed the unsanitary conditions of the meatpacking business. Okay. Uh, so according to your book, 
uh, muckraker was a um, a critical term okay first used by Theodore Roosevelt okay he coins the term to, and this is to, to describe investigative journalists who published exposés of political scandals and industrial abuses pu uh, published them in popular women's magazines again to reach that audience the, that that middle class uh, group of women that have disposable income and spare time and they're the ones that kind of rise up and, and create these progressive movements okay uh, take our next break here and watch the next film and it's entitled unit 3 progressive era part 3 muckrakers go ahead and watch that and come on back okay so the political machines and the progressives these are the two sides that were in conflict in this era at this time the political machines such as Bosch Tweed uh, running amok with scandal and corruption, run by greed, power, love of money, versus the progressive journalists, the muckrakers, that saw the abuse and intended to expose them to affect change. So these two groups, in my estimation anyway, are who defined this era, okay? <clears throat> so, you, so you have the rise of journalism and newspapers, and of course they've been around for a while, but even more so with the, with the influx of so many people and you have the rise of what is called yellow journalism. This is a derogatory term, okay? So yellow journalism is where you embellish and exaggerate the news to sell newspapers. This would be the precursor to the National Enquirer, the Globe. You know, when you're in the market at the checkout stand, you're reading these articles about President Trump was kidnapped by Martians and taken to Mars and where he's had 12 children and whatever it might be. Complete nonsense, but people buy it. Okay, Yellow journalism, exaggerate things, create a fervor. So a famous person that did this, created a huge empire, William Randolph Hearst. Was he a yellow journalist? I think most people would say yes. Uh, he's, he was instrumental in this type of journalism. Uh, and he creates a, a empire. If, if any of you ever ever been to Hearst Castle up north, that was his home, a very opulent house that's that's gaudy and opulent beyond belief compared to you know most other homes in, in California. Uh, very gets very 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 wealthy from this um, this journalism style of journalism. So he is instrumental in this type of journalism that we call yellow journalism, and we'll soon see the next chapter two, where this type of journalism by him helps start a war that America gets involved in, the War of 1898, the Spanish-American War. His his newspapers are, are challenging men to go fight this war to be a man, okay? So we'll talk about that when we get there, okay? <clears throat> okay, so, but the people living in these cities, okay, life is not, not a picture of sunshine for these people. Life is Pretty awful. They, they were depressed, worked too hard, never had any money. Whether you're white or black, okay, didn't you, you just you couldn't get ahead, and you lived, uh, you know, very poor. Uh, but out of it comes a style of music that becomes very American. It's called the blues. So the blues is not operatic singing. It's kind of rough and and uh, maybe a little raspy. And <clears throat> you're talking about the negative side of life. Me and my my dog died. My, my woman left me. I lost my job. I don't have any money. I got no hope. I got the blues. Okay. And this becomes a, a very American genre of music that, that becomes very, very popular, turning away from the old operatic, you know, singing where you, you have a, you know, a more of an opera sounding voice and always talking about things that are so nice and happy all the time. Always a good ending, typically white people. Now you have African-Americans singing, and it becomes very popular. But generally, in the beginning, talking the turn of the 19th century here, white audiences, while they like the music, would not go see black artists, okay? Uh, this is a problem. They like it, but they don't want to, you know, uh, go see black artists. So this creates an opportunity for people in the recording business. If we could find a white man who could sing black music, in that blue style, we're going to make a, a, a whole a whole bunch of money here. So in comes Elvis Presley, Harry Lee Lewis, people like this. These are white men singing black blues music, and white America loves this. And of course, these these men become very very popular, specifically Elvis. 
uh, they're able to go see this kind of music now without having to go to a black, see a black artist. So black performers would not be accepted by white audiences until the 60s, okay, with the rise of Motown records. And we'll talk about that when we get to the 60s here in this class. So that so the society changes. Uh, young people have more spare time. They don't have to work all the time. So they start to, you know, engage in things that are fun. So dance halls where you go and dance with the, you know, uh, people that are there. And this is an urban craze that had never been seen before. The you know dance halls and of course this is dancing changed from the from the Victorian era that moralistic non profane era, uh, that kind of curmudgeon type of, of you know person that, that doesn't want to have any fun. Uh, in the past you, had, you in the Victorian days if you were to dance at all with a member of the opposite sex you had to be at arm's length you can't put your bodies together, and you were chaperone a parent would be there to watch you okay. Now you've got sexually suggestive dancing, uh, and of course the parents were appalled. Uh, in their minds, there's a continued loss of a religious backbone, and morals began to change. So you know, again, this is the start of a, of a society that looks much like ours, right? Free time, disposable income, entertainment choices, but still rigidly racially divided. Lack of opportunities for non-white people. Okay, so this progressive era is synonymous with the Industrial Revolution. It it was a result of it. You know, America is built on freedom, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But truly, most of the people in America were workers with no real hope. Not exactly the American dream. People were drowning in despair. It didn't matter who you were, unless you were a middle class or higher white man. Opportunities to better yourself and your family situation were mostly non-existent for a typical person. Uh, workers were treated treated some uh, somewhat like slaves were back in the day, pre-Civil War. You you worked these people to death, and you simply replaced them with a warm body. Okay, so during slavery, the the build up to the Civil War, many of the slave owners would criticize the North and their worker situation. I mean, who are you to to judge us? Yes, we own people, and we put them in shacks in the back of our homes, and they don't live very nicely, but we, they have a place to live, they work, they eat, we take care of them from birth to death. What's happening in the North? These people may not be slaves, but they're slaves to their wages, they're low, low pay, they're, it's called wage slavery. So yeah, slaves lived in shacks, but Northern workers live in tenements. What's the difference? It's the same, okay? And they have a point. So, so the progressive era was an attempt to get these freedoms back. You know, people saw the injustice of it. People with clout were made aware by the muckrakers. So they pushed for a reform, okay? And these eras happen in history, but they tend to come and go. We're looking at this one here, the turn of the century. The progressive era was a, was a great thing to, to create reform for these people being, being uh, treated poorly, being abused. But World War I would put a, a very quick end to it, as we'll see. The 1960s, a cultural change, gains in civil rights, anti-war, you know, a counterculture saying no to the government, we don't want to be, we don't believe in you. That was replaced by self-centered 1970s. And then in the 1980s, the religious right takes hold and the, the, the reforms of the 60s started to die. Okay, so... It never seems to fail that when you have a movement like this, something comes along to knock it down. In the, in the case of the Progressive Era, World War I came out of the blue and put an end to all the charity, okay? Okay. Um, so let's do a supplemental lecture right here, number five. This will be entitled, Did the Progressive Era Save America? Okay. So, briefly, a sketch outline. Number one, <clears throat> background development. Always give me an introduction in your essay with, with, with what I kind of give you as a, as a background when I start the, the uh, lecture. So, letter A would be progressivism. So, what is that? What does progressivism mean? Make sure you tell me that. Number two is the Bolshevik Revolution. And we'll, you learn what that is. And that has one point, letter A main points. So give me the main points of the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay. <clears throat> Number three, the relevance. Unlike Russia, in America, 
a middle class stepped in and pushed for change and better workers' lives. So the progressive movement may have saved America from another revolution. So that's that's the uh, that's the sketch outline. We'll fill on, fill in all the blanks here with the lecture itself. Okay. Okay. So you have the ability to go back and and you know write this over again. So I'm I'm just gonna say it one time. Okay. So moving on with our lecture. So progressivism is a loose term for reformers, especially those from the elite and middle classes who work to improve the political system, fight poverty, conserve environmental resources, and increase governmental involvement in the economy. Uh, so, I mean, we, we've, we've learned this. We, we know about this, but um, that, that would be the uh, definition. Given their name to the progressive era, such reformers are often prompted to act by fear that mass radical protests by workers and farmers would spread, as well as by their desire to enhance social welfare and social justice. So that's a okay. okay they these progress these progressivists want to enhance social welfare, social justice. That's a good thing. Uh, so in this in this lecture, the argument I'm trying to make is the truth is without this movement, this, this progressive era, it's hard to say what would have happened in the United States. The truth is the United States, while professing that we don't want anything to do with the European ways, we, we came over here to get away from that. And I mentioned before how they always tend to knock down any kind of notion that takes them that direction. We want to be our own people with our own points of view. That's what makes America great. Okay, that's, that's the idea, but it's about the people. But here in this era, America had become very much like the very European countries they chose to escape. The same countries they wanted to get away from and not be like them. But here they are, a ruling class that dominates the working class. It sounds like feudalism all over again, okay? Uh, so going back a little bit you know, uh, before our class starts, but important to kind of make my point here, 1823 – America and, the, and its president, James Monroe, uh, with the help of John Quincy Adams, writes the Monroe Doctrine. So what is that? Well, 1823, you know, America's been around now for 50 years or, or so. You fought a revolution. You won that revolution. You had a second uh, War of Independence, the War of 1812, again against Britain. You, you won that battle. So, so by 1823, there's no denying that America can stand on its own, and they kind of, you know, want to create a power base of their own. So they have enough confidence by this point to say to Europe, don't come over here. And in the cartoon, you see Uncle Sam standing on one side of the earth looking back at the, at the kings and the, and the, and the leaders of, of Europe and saying, stay over there, don't come here. If you come over here anymore to colonize or disrupt anything in North and South America, we're going to take that as an act of aggression, and we're going to intervene and, if, if need be, go to war. So this is an example of, of the United States wanting to separate itself from Europe and become isolationist, isolated from Europe and its problems, okay? But here you are going back down the same road, you're looking a lot like them again. So people question this. So the progressive movement's a reform movement. Without a reform movement, to give people hope, America could have had a revolution like Russia did. Uh, so I'm talking about the Bolshevik Revolution here. This is what happened in Russia in 1917. Okay, So this is a revolution that happens in the midst of World War I. Uh, the Russian people revolt. So I'm going to use this revolution as an example to, to show the difference between Russia, who didn't have a progressive movement, and America that did. And the argument is, did, did this progressive movement keep America from doing the same thing that Russia did? So what happened in Russia in 1917? Well, firstly, the Bol Bolshevik is a Russian word that means communist. Okay, So you're talking about communism here. So this revolution starts after 11 million peasants, the working class. And understand, this is where you're in the midst of World War I, one of the most uh, degrading wars ever. Trench warfare, no, no real strategy, just, just a lot of death. And unfortunately, modern technology had, had far surpassed military tactics. And 
strategies to, to fight the old way, put men in front of weapons that could, that could you know, kill them in large numbers. So many, many millions of people die in this war. This many people had never died before in a war. Millions. Never had happened before. So, of course, the peasants are the people out in the front lines. They're the ones doing all the dying, right? So they're angry about this. And uh, in their minds, they were dragged into World War I. And they became discouraged. All the injuries. Men come home with missing limbs. And they don't come home at all. Fathers and husbands, uh, millions die and don't come home. So Russia was in somewhat in ruins and ripe for revolution because people don't stand for things for very long. You know, everybody's going to revolt if you're if you're being oppressed. It's just human nature. And understand that that's where America came from. Was was not just saying I've had enough. Let's stand up and revolt against against the order. Okay. So the, so the Russian peasants do this, and supported by huge crowds of striking industrial workers, key word is industrial workers, the protesters clash with police but refuse to leave the streets. Uh, the strikes spread among the, the workers, and irate mobs destroyed police stations. Uh, a lot of this was done by Russian women, taking to the streets to protest their living conditions. It was International Women's Day. And the women of Russia were ready to be heard. An estimated 90,000 women marched to the streets. Why all women? Because their husbands were on the front lines, probably getting killed. They were home, forced to work in the factories, and live, give up a lot of, a lot of things to, to survive. Many of them lost their husbands. Many of them lost their sons. They're angry. What, what kind of life is this? Why do I want to be here? Why would I fight for you? you don't, you're not doing anything for us. So they go out in the streets and, and, and protest, and, they, and they're yelling, bread, give us food. Come with the autocracy, the, the uh, you know, ruling elite that doesn't care about us. Stop the war. There's enough death already. Everyone's gone. Millions are dead. They're tired, hungry, and angry. These women were working long hours in miserable conditions to feed their families because their husbands and fathers uh, were at the front fighting the war. So they want change, and they're, they're screaming for it. They've had enough. The next day, more than 150,000 men and women took to the streets to protest, to help join them. And soon many more joined, and finally the cities were shut down, and nobody was working. They've, they've taken over and, and brought the, the city to a halt. So long story short, it's a much longer story than this, but... Long story short, the revolution was complete, and they overthrew the Russian government. They took it over, and they installed the first communist government in history and the beginning of the communist country that America would become mortal enemies with throughout the 19th century, I'm sorry, 20th century until 1991. Uh, and even, even today, we still you know, are, are at odds with Russia, okay? So it's a long story, but I think it's one worth telling. And I don't want to lose context here, but we're talking about the American progressive movement mostly here. So the point I'm trying to make is, without a strong reform movement, the progressive movement, from the middle and upper class white population, you may have had the same result in America that you had in Russia. So there might have been another American revolution. Uh you know, where you have a situation where the workers unite and stand up and say no more. So it could have resulted in a coup d'etat or a coup. So what, what does that mean? What was a coup d'etat? A sudden and decisive action in politics, especially one resulting in a change of government illegally or by force. It is an overthrow of a government, but not necessarily a result from the war. So you can have a coup d'etat and depose somebody without fighting a war. Uh, it, it could just be a very secret takeover. It could happen very quickly. In this case, the workers rise up and shut down and take over, okay? Uh, so this didn't happen in America. Why? And this, 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 is the, this is the relevance. In America, you have the progressive movement, the progressivists, the muckrakers out there, you know, uh, exposing the, the – uh, the bad side of the industrial, the underside of the industrial revolution. Okay, so the argument I'm trying to make is because America had a progressive movement, the workers here 
could see light at the end of the tunnel. It's bad for us, but these people are working for us, so we 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 have hope for the future. Okay, in in Russia they didn't have that, so they 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 revolted, and and the rest is history. Okay, so here's the relevance of the lecture one more time. Unlike Russia in America, a middle class stepped in and pushed for change and bettered workers' lives. So the progressive movement may have saved America from another revolution, okay? And that is the end of that lecture, okay? Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is the progressive movement was very important in America. It stopped them from following what Russia did. If they had had that, perhaps they would have, they would not have had a revolution, okay? So this, so this, uh, this progressive era, the Russian Revolution, it's all part of this era. <clears throat> Russian Revolution is a very important development in history because it's the first communist government, but also this successful rising of the people. Uh, so why is this important in American history? Why am I talking about Russia in the United States history class? Russia remains America's mortal enemy, and even though the Soviet Union fell in the early, 19, early 1990s, uh, they remain America's most feared opponent. Uh, so I realize that we've gone a little bit ahead of where we are in our class. Uh, all this occurs after World War I, but it relates to the progressive era and this idea that America saved itself with the reform movement of the progressive era. Uh, History is taught, best taught in a thematic fashion or by theme. So in this case, I'm taking the progressive era past where we're at in the class to make my point. Okay. So you have a lot of things going on here in, in this class so far. Uh, we're, you know, we've only had a few chapters, but we've had a civil war, industrial revolution, reconstruction, Jim Crow South, progressive movement, women's movement, black civil rights, Bolshevik revolution, and we're approaching World War One and World War Two. All these, all these, uh, you know, events and incidents tend to intersect each other, and it really does kind of paint the story. It was a complicated time, a lot of things going on. And when you go through mass, massive change like that, that's kind of what happens, okay? So this is the start of communist Russia, and this sets the stage for the arms race, the space race, and all these things will, that will continue throughout the duration of the 20th century, and you could argue continues to this day, okay? So back to our, our progressive era, pre-World War I, the muckrakers, and you have other, other people that, that speak out. Helen Campbell also writes a book about the horrors of animate living, like Jacob Reese, another expose, okay? And she she's saying that but young kids are, are living in an unhealthy environment. You see this image right here. Young kids playing in the street. There's a dead horse right there. You know, dead horses rot and flies come and disease comes out of it. There's men down the street working and doing whatever they're doing, a lot of them. They don't. They don't care. It's just part of life, right? I mean, today we have, you know, departments of a city that would come out and pick up a dead animal and take it away, but they don't then because nobody thought about that. Understand, a lot of these, a lot of these regulations come because because they become obvious. It wasn't obvious when you build a city. What are we gonna do about dead horses? What, what are we gonna do about garbage? You don't think about those things until it happens. Okay, so you have to kind of, you know, react down the road as these things occur, okay? <clears throat> but the problem is it's unhealthy. It's their unhealthy cities uh, ripe with disease and, and, and pollutants and dirty water and, uh, you know, rotten milk, okay? Uh, if you're in the, <clears throat> if you're a dairy farmer, you're in the milk business. And the problem with that is that you could get a lot of milk, but if you don't sell it pretty quickly, a lot of it goes bad. You're losing product, right? So what what would they do? Of course, you know it's a beer business, man. You don't want to lose lose your profits. So people would put plaster of Paris in the milk to make it look whiter. They would thicken it with starch and eggs or molasses, something to make it look drinkable, not like this. And people would drink it, and it might taste okay because of the molasses, but in fact it's rotten and it makes you sick. Okay. So that this this is where these muckrakers are. This is what what they're looking at. All these all these you know ideas that are harmful to people. I mentioned, you know, waste. No one knows what to do with it. So you just shove it in every corner you can. Throw it in the river, throw it in the lake. Industrial waste from factories. What do we do with it? Throw it in the streams, throw it in the rivers. Pollution becomes part of this era. <clears throat> you know, how, how do you get rid of all this garbage? 
Children played on piles of garbage, breathed toxic air, consumed poisonous food, milk, and water. And here's a sobering statistic right here. Infant mortality rates were one in three. One in three children died in this era because it's it was a you know a filthy uh, environment and and disease ridden. Okay. Uh, so because of all this, you have the rise of what is called the City Beautiful Movement. So Central Park would be a good example of this. Uh, the City Beautiful Movement advocated for landscape beautification, playgrounds, more urban parks. Central Park, you look at this modern day picture of New York City, there's this big park in the middle. So if you live in the big city on top of each other, you're always a few blocks away from this incredibly large park. <clears throat> Now, if you could imagine how much that property is worth right now, if you were to develop that today, you would make trillions of dollars, and you couldn't even hardly come up with the amount of money you'd make. But the but the citizens of New York defiantly say, no, do not take our park. That's our character. That's our image, and we love to go to the park to get out of the city. Okay, this is part of this beautification uh, of the city beautiful movement. Okay. So the National Playground Association is begun promoting skating rinks, tennis courts, baseball fields, swimming pools, flower gardens, tree-lined streets, all these things. Again, nobody thought of it. We live in that world today where most of our streets today in the residential areas are landscaped. But they didn't do that. They didn't think about that. Okay, so you want to make it look nicer, okay? Okay, so we talked about women and their problems in trying to, you know, come into the workplace and are, were they safe and all those types of ideas. So women come to the big cities with with lots of, of you know, opportunity and hope in their eyes. But you come and, and you run into licentiousness and prostitution and white slavery, this, you know, the kidnapping of women to be to be sold as sex slaves. Do we have that kind of world today? Both of these things are still running rampant in our society today, both of them. Uh, so pretty clearly, we still have some more reforms to do. The, the progressive movement continue, continues on today, perhaps. So women come to the big cities burning with high hope and filled with great resolve. But the remorseless city takes them, grinds them, crushes them, and at last deposits them in unknown graves. That's pretty bleak. But this, this was the plight of many women. Their dreams were crushed and they became just another number and, and, and forgotten. So the last class we had a supplemental lecture about were women safe from men in the workplace or anywhere else for that matter. Women had never been in these situations before. Were they safe from men regarding crimes of opportunity? Would a man uh, be on his best behavior if he found himself in a, in the, in a part of a factory by himself with a woman? Would he... Would he behave himself? Not everybody thought that he would, okay? So I'm not trying to take this too far outside here, guys. I'm, I'm trying to come up – what I'm trying to come up with is why men in general – and again, this is not my point of view. This is a point of view of a lot of historians, okay? Uh, why men in general seem to resort to taking advantage of women if given the opportunity. I'm talking historically here. In history, women have been treated poorly by men. And taken advantage of by men. And truthfully, it didn't change much until the end of World War II. That was that is not that far back. My parents are still alive and they grew up in the World War II era. So not that far back, one generation. It wasn't until the end of World War II that we started being nicer towards people in general. Uh, that seems a little far-fetched, but it's the truth, okay? Uh, so Freud, going back to Sigmund Freud, he seems to think that this is man's natural state to be violent when set free of the constraints of civilization and be aggressive toward women. So again, this, this was a huge uh, uh, problem and concern of this day, okay? So vice commissions are, are started, vice squads. So, so what does vice mean? Vice is fighting any kind of bad or immoral behavior or habits. So pornography, prostitution, but, but also smoking and drinking were considered vices. So commissions were formed to create a safe environment for women, to keep women safe from these men, okay? Uh, an offshoot from, vi from fighting vice were settlement houses, settlement homes. Uh, these would be uh, a home set apart 
as a center for people to come for help. So a definition would be a community welfare center that investigated the plight of the urban poor, raised funds to address urgent needs, and help neighborhood residents advocate on their own behalf. Social settlements became a nationally recognized reform strategy during the progressive era. So these settlements truly are a very important part of the history of immigration because the immigrants that came, many would go to these mostly women, but not always though. I mean, men were allowed, but probably mostly women went to these to, to come to a place where they could learn the ways of America, learn, learn how to learn English, learn how to get a job, learn how to apply for a job. Uh, to Americanize, to figure out a way to integrate into this very fast-moving uh, civilization that was unlike the one they came from, okay? One of the more famous settlements, ha settlement houses was the Hull House. This is in Chicago, uh, established by Jane Addams. We, we stand today united in a belief in beauty, genius, and courage, and that these can transform the world. So an idealist, right? you got to love an idealist. Uh, so... She's trying to create a center to, to, that results in community improvement and political reform. So she offered employment counseling, medical clinics, daycare centers. So again, it starts to sound like the type of, of society that we have today. This is where it all starts in the progressive movement at the turn of the 20th century. Okay? Adams believed her, her whole house was a bridge between the classes with as much of a help the well-to-do as to the poor. So her training was available to anyone? Well, that's what she's saying. And I don't know how many wealthy people went there, but they were welcome to, okay? I doubt very many did, but perhaps some did. Uh, Adams and her colleagues believed that working-class Americans already knew what they needed, what they wanted, what they were striving for, what they lacked with the resources to fulfill those needs, as well as a political voice, again, access to opportunity, right? You have to get that to, to uh, turn your opportunity into, into a positive for yourself, okay? So her house was in Chicago. Uh, why there? Well, Chicago was the final destination point for many immigrants, New York City, Baltimore, were others. Uh, why? Because they were large cities with employment opportunities. So, so what was special about Chicago? Well, we, we go back to the long drive. Remember the cattle drive? The cowboys driving their cattle north to the Transcontinental Railroad, put their cattle on the trains alive. They would go to Chicago where all the slaughterhouses were. They would then be butchered and slaughtered there, packed on refrigerated train cars and moved east, and you have much less spoilage, okay? You're, you're able to transport your cattle alive almost all the way to the east coast. So these slaughterhouses created opportunity for, for employment. Uh, packing companies, meat packing companies, very, very big uh, industry in Chicago in that time. I mean, if you, if you got a job in that industry, the, it was pretty awful. You'd be covered with blood and muck and gore by the end of the day because you're constantly hacking away at animals. So it's pretty bloody, pretty awful. But work, okay? And I'm certainly not putting down, you know, the, the meat cutting business. You know, if you uh, are in that business, you know that you you are around a lot of, of uh, you know, raw meat and a lot of it's pretty bloody. So when you're actually in a in a slaughterhouse where you're slaughtering live animals, it's going to, it's going to be a blood bath. So you're covered in blood by the end of the day. But in the meatpacking business, there was a lot of also corruption scandal and people selling much like the, like the dairyman. If you're in the meat business, it's going to go bad. So if you have a lot of meat, you better sell it quick or you're going to lose it. So as these meats would turn bad, they would doctor them up to make them look better. OK, like they weren't really rotten and people would eat this rotten meat and get very sick. OK, of course, uh, Upton Sinclair's the, uh, the book, The Jungle, uh, is another he's another muckraker. Uh, and The Jungle is an expose on the horrific condition of the meatpacking industry. So many of you may have uh, read The Jungle in high school. I did. And it was one of the most horrifying books I've ever read. It was frightening to, to read what these people got away with. But again, the muckrakers come up in Sinclair. He exposes it. Out of it comes the, the, the Food and Drug Administration and all these kind of ideas that, that help create safer food for all of us, okay? 
let's take our last break here and watch this this film entitled Up in Sinclair's The Jungle School Tube. I'm not sure what that means, but that's the title of it. It's a YouTube video. Go ahead and watch that and then come on back. Okay, so meatpacking. Uh, Up in Sinclair, you know, exposes all the all the awful things going on there, okay? <clears throat> This results in the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. It regulates conditions in the food and drug industries to ensure a safe supply of food and medicine. <clears throat> so Chicago, like these other big cities, cities with employment opportunities, it grew quickly with immigrants from different co countries and going back to the Hull House was a place for them to come to learn the ways and assimilate into American society. <clears throat> So people say, well, well, wait a minute, we, we, were, we were criticizing Americanization before. We talked about the Native American children being taken from their homes and converted from, the, this is the same person on the left preschool and the right post school, and that this was an awful thing to do, take these kids from their parents, from the, from the tribes, take them far enough away where they can't run away and go back home and convert them to be an American and they took away their religions, their customs, their language, cut their hair. Is 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 a settlement house a subtle form of Americanization? Well, you know, I I don't I don't tend to think so. I I get where it's similar, but these these kids had no choice. They they were forced to let go of their culture and their and their and their traditional life ways. Okay, the the settlement houses were a person's choice to come and gain skills to allow them to better integrate into American society. So I, I would personally say that that would not be the same thing. Okay, let's wrap it up with one more incident that kind of kind of paints the story of the whole problem of the Industrial uh, Revolution, Industrial Era. The Triangle Shirtwaist Company, okay, this is a company way up in a skyscraper, nine, ten floors up. You've got like a sweatshop, right? One, one whole floor of sewing machines, on ventilated hot and so on uh, women and children making very very low wages pumping out these clothes at mass quantity uh, you know that's their job so one one evening or one day uh, the workers are all working away in this in this sweatshop like room and the managers decide that they want to leave maybe they're gonna go to lunch whatever it was they decide that they want to leave but but they can't really leave the workers you know, unsupervised. So, so they lock them in. They, they locked all the doors on the floor. So if the workers wanted to leave, they couldn't until they came back. Okay. <clears throat> Unfortunately, a fire breaks out. And of course, you're talking about flammable material in a, you know, sewing uh, a, a room that's full of cloth and all these types of things go up in flames pretty quickly. So this fire spreads quickly in this room. 146 people are working in this room. They try to get out, but the doors are locked. So, of course, they can't get out. Some dove out of the windows um, because, you know, uh, being burnt to death by fires, you'd rather jump out of the window, right? I mean, like you, you, you make crazy decisions. Uh, so this, of course, was a horrifying incident, and people were shocked, and, of course, the Middle class women, oh my gosh, what's going on with these young kids that, that were here and these women making nothing. Now they're all gone because of the ignorance of these of these supervisors. So this this incident exposed uh, the fire hazards, the unsafe machines, the low wages, the working hours of women and children. And I would say it would be a, perhaps a cornerstone event that sparks this well, not, I mean, it was already going on by this time, but this is, this is, these kind of instances where this progressive movement came from. We got to do something to, to help these people have better lives and not be, not be uh, taken advantage of. Okay. Okay. So our next chapter, chapter 20 is a continuation of this era, but we'll meet Teddy Roosevelt, a great progressive. Okay. And the next chapter is entitled, Whose Government? Politics, Populists, and Progressives. Thank you.